Welcome everyone to Mondays with Mountain Mamas. How's everybody tonight? Happy Memorial Day. You too. It is, it's been a beautiful day. It's starting to rain, so uh, we may lose internet. So just <laughs> FYI. And uh, just taking a moment, if we could, to thank all of those who obviously gave all uh, thanks to all who have sacrificed so much for us and to their families. Uh, we are thankful and we are grateful for your service and for everything that you do to preserve um, our freedom here in this great United States. And uh, tonight we have, well, we're going to kind of, uh, we used to call this um, freestyle and clogging when I was a clogger. So <laughs> we're going to kind of freestyle it tonight. Uh, we've got a couple things we want to talk about, and uh, DL, I'm going to turn it over to you to get the ball running. Thank you. Um, as I announced last week, this was supposed to be all our welcome here, and Delegate Walker was going to be the incumbent to lead things off because it was going to be about LGBTQ, disenfranchised, marginalized, uh, women's equity, all kinds of things that were very important to her. But she wanted to head back to Morgantown. She was in Charleston. Yeah, someone's got their uh, Facebook on. I'm trying to turn it off. I'm sorry. I just tried to start. My phone's off, but I'll just, I give up. I was trying to start a watch party, but I can't get it to stop. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. All right. Hey, guys, hey guys this, is live, this is live video. So, you know, sometimes these things happen. Anyway, DL, go right on ahead. Okay. So, well, in terms of the live video, uh, Patty made us a little Memorial Day picnic. So I am coming live to you from her home on Norwood Road. And I had a nice setup outside because it was so beautiful out. And she had a, a Cut, cut out of West Virginia that was going to be my background. And um, 10 minutes before we started, it started pouring rain. So I rushed into her nice kitchen that has all vintage red appliances. Um, and then her internet went out. So if you lose one of us, you lose both of us tonight. <laughs> but, um, but I managed to set my computer up so that you can see um, another West Virginia scene. That is the sesquicentennial poster, uh, the 150th birthday of West Virginia. Uh, Charlie Hamilton, a uh, West Virginia artist that you may know, uh, did that piece. And uh, it is framed and hanging in every Hamilton house there is. And so I have my new background and now I'll get back to how we're not doing this week, what we were going to, but uh, all those mamas will be back next week to talk about those topics. But Daniel Walker, I can't remember what the occasion was, but at one point her summary of whatever it was we were going through was that's okay because we are fierce and flexible and today kind of proved that yes we are fierce and flexible because um we changed everything up and stephanie agreed to come on and we have our regulars barbara and patty to update us on what they want to do there's not much news from the past week including no new donors um but hopefully that will change by next week um but as if you were on last week or listened to the recording, we were talking about election reform, clean elections, getting money out of politics. And I don't know if it was because of um, something that was said or so many people asking me about the Supreme Court candidates, but I decided to write a letter to the editor and I wrote it as Mountain Mamas, just letting people know how important that vote was that, you know, this is not a primary, there is no runoff, who gets the most votes, and that can be less than a majority, uh, will be on the Supreme Court for 12 years. So I just did a quick letter to the editor that let people know that the uh, West Virginia Citizens for Clean Elections, the coalition that I am a part of, uh, joined with West Virginia Consumer Protection Alliance, and they have a nice website where they allowed every Supreme Court candidate to respond to a questionnaire, and they simply uh, put those 
answers on their website without editing. And that website is West Virginia Court Elections dot org and sarah's going to put that up in the comments so that if uh you know voters who would like to know more about the supreme court candidates it's a 12-year term and you want to get that you want to vote for who you think should be um interpreting the laws and ruling on issues of constitutionality and other things for 12 years you want to get that vote right so that is something that can help you make a decision with that vote so now to our new regrouped Memorial Day Mondays with Mountain Mamas. Um, I was hoping that Carla Jones could be on or Tina Russell since they are uh, the two mamas who are also veterans, uh, but they are also two mamas that have dodgy internet service. And there's some mamas that you may never see unless Susan Perry or others get to a place with decent service because they simply can't do video live stream based on the internet in their area. Uh, but we wish a good day to uh, Tina Russell from Mercer County and Carla Jones, who is running for Senate from the second district and wish they could be with us. We've invited some mamas to just come on and say hello if they want to. But for right now, you've got the three of them and take it away. Barbara, let's go to you first. You're muted right now, so you'll want to unmute yourself. Um, can you test one, two? Can yeah. Barbara? Can you hear us? Oh, no, she's okay. Oh, yeah, you're you've muted yourself, Barbara. Okay. There you I'm go. On. There we go. Okay, well, I clicked it a bunch of times. Anyway, okay. good. Well, um, Barbara, well, first of all, Delegate Flashower, thank you so much. You have some really great information that we're, you're going to be sharing. I have a link uh, that I have with the information that you're going to be providing this evening. So when you want me to uh, share that, you just let me know and I'll put it up there for everyone to see. Okay. Well, first, let me say hello to all of you who are on the show with me and also to you in virtual land for listening to this. Um, I'm pretty excited about what we're going to talk about tonight. And I uh, look forward to looking at you, looking at the this information on the state's um, COVID-19 website. There's been a lot of new information added, and I think it has some repercussions for everybody in West Virginia. Um, some, of, some of it is uh, good news. Some of it is worrisome news. So, um, and my name is Barbara Evans Fleischauer. I'm a longtime delegate from Montegalia County, and I am very proud and happy to be in the Mountain Mamas. We definitely need more women in the legislature in West Virginia. Our numbers have gone down instead of up. And I think we need more progressive women, which is um, my definition of what a Mountain Mama is, somebody that um, cares a lot about women's issues and working together with other women. So um, I, I have worked on women's issues a long time, um, but tonight um, the teaser is I'm going to talk to you about men's issues and some very surprising information about COVID-19. So um, Sarah, do you want to um, pull up the DHHR dashboard, the COVID-19 dashboard? Yep, I sure can. I will get on that. And there are two other things I want to show, Sarah, um, that I think I included in that message to you, if we can. There's an article from the Brookings Institute, and mm -hmm. then there's a graph within that Brookings Institute article. So if we can do that a little bit later, but when you want to pull that um, screen up, uh, when you have that, go ahead. I'm ready right. to talk about it. Okay. Okay. So... Uh -huh. This is what the COVID-19 website looks at, looks like, and you can get there from the governor's homepage or from the DHHR COVID-19 page. This is DHHR's page. But what you have to do once you get here is scroll down to get to the homepage. And this is the homepage um, with these uh, 
five now major pieces of information. Um, the number of cases, the number of deaths, the deaths have gone up since yesterday, sadly. Um, the number of lab tests, that's a wonderful number. You know, there was a point in time when we only had 150 state, um, tests for the whole state. And a lot of things that went wrong um, here and everywhere was because we did not have access to the supplies or, you know, all parts of the test. The two numbers on the far right, the cumulative percent and the daily percent, um, the daily percent has really gone down. And I think that's because we've had all these special testings, which means we've tested more people and the, the positive rate is probably low. The cumulative percent is all of the tests that have been given so far. West Virginia only has um, 2.05% that were positive. That's very good. Um, Sarah, go click at the state comparison, which is a tab on the far right, just to compare. Far right on the top, above the 2.05. Let's just go there real quick. You can see um, that we're doing really well. Percent of tests positive. That's the bottom right-hand side, and that ha shows our surrounding states. Um, that's pretty darn good. Okay, what's new is um, where I want you to go now to the tab that says County Summary, Sarah. And this, I think, is really what everybody kind of wants to know. What's going on? Is it not clicking? No. Oh. It should be a little. There, there we go. go. A hand. Okay. So what this shows um, it, it, look, it tells you a lot of demographics about what has happened in your county. And so I've seen mine. Let's click on Marion County, which is under mine. Um, Mon is up at the top. It's no, 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 no. You got to click on the map. So click and you, you probably want to hover. Yeah. Hover okay. over Mar That's Harrison. Go up, up, up a little to Marion where Stephanie lives. Okay. Come on, Marion. Oh, goodness. You have to really, really, I can't even, can somebody read out those numbers? <laughs> yes, I can read out those numbers. So give me just a second and see if it'll oh, come back I, I think on. I got it now. Okay. Okay. So the reason this, the whole scandal um, about African Americans uh, started with a church service in primarily in Mon County, um, but a lot of the people who were infected were from Marion County. And our delegation, um, prompted very much by Danielle Walker, started asking the administration to put up the county numbers and put up the racial numbers. And they put them up one day and then they took them down. But if you look at that positive cases by race, you'll see that um, it's half, you know, in Marion County. It's really, really tragic. Now, they have sort of stayed at the same number of cases and the same number of fatalities for quite some time. Um, and um, the, what they don't have on this county thing is the death rate. And I'm going to go into that a little bit more, but 100% of the deaths in Mary, is it two deaths, right? Yes. 100% of them are African American. Now that's very different. Um, let's go, let's look at Mon just in case you're interested because it's very different. We've had a lot more confirmed positives and, um, Can you, yeah, that's good. Um, and we've also had our fair share of deaths. Um, all of them have been at uh, a nursing home. And um, now they show how many active cases there are. There's a lot less. Uh, there's mostly better news. Um, but you can see that the positive cases by race are three times the percentage in the population. Almost all of West Virginia is um, 3.6, 3.9. Um, I think it probably shows over, um, and you, and it's interesting. 
Look at the demographics of the people tested in Mon County. Um, female is 62.5%. Those are the people that were tested. And the people that were positive were 60%. Um, and I'm going to go into that a little bit more when we talk about, maybe we should um, talk about that Brookings okay. um, Institute article. And I don't know, can we put that, um, or well, maybe not, maybe we should keep looking at this stuff because we don't want to switch around too much. Okay. So just sort of remember that, that most of the people who are being tested are female. And does that surprise anyone in this group? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, we, I don't know if you've ever, if you're married or if you live with a man, you know, they don't go to the doctor. And um, what we're going to find out is their death rate is much, much higher, especially once you adjust it by age. And I think it's, um, I think we all need to know that. And, you know, I, I'm very used to being called a nag, but, um, you know, that's, that's what we really have to be. So, oh, I haven't seen that before. What was that? Yeah. Sarah? So they have a new table format here that um, you can go and look at all the counties. So I'm gonna go to Mont and you can highlight it and then it shows uh, how many tests and the daily cases, probable cases, recovered and deaths. And then up here in the middle, that's the female daily cases, the com confirmatory lab tests, male daily cases and confirmatory lab tests for them but it doesn't have male female or black white it like does death, actually death for death no i don't see that okay and actually the good news is about that um is i i wrote to the our um public health director kathy slimp who i really like and i said you know look at this article which i had heard about that before that it affected men more than women um, but this was a recent article and it had a lot of international information and the scariest information is from New York. And we're going to look at that a little bit later, but um, she said they would look into it because she thought it was a good question too. And I don't know, maybe other people don't have time to look at this stuff. Okay. Now I want to go to something different. So let's, let's move out of this tab, the County summary tab and go back to the main page the home page or whatever we want to call that thing. Oh, crud. Oh, or that's all right. We'll get it. Yeah. Okay. And then we are actually going to scroll down. So if you scroll down here, there's a whole lot more stuff that I didn't even know about it. I didn't realize this stuff was on here till a couple of weeks ago, but you can see every day's report. And if you are interested in doing that and you can follow it, you can plot it, and um, that's the updates in the news. And then this information on the in the middle is really pretty interesting also. Um, uh, the and, and the FAQs are interesting also, but I want to go to correctional facilities okay. next. I have been participating in a group. So can you click on that one? Uh, yes. Great. I have been participating in a group weekly phone call um, because I've been very interested in um, corrections reform for a couple of years. We have overcrowded jails and prisons. Jails are the short term places where you have lesser crimes. But a lot of times people are in jail are there because they're waiting. They couldn't afford bail or they're waiting to for a bed in our prison system. So these are people who are innocent and who um, you know, are just sort of are there in limbo. So go down to the next to the last one, which says DCR facility COVID-19, the next to the last, not the last, that one. And the reason we have been having these weekly phone calls and is there a way you can get uh, I'm really interested in Huttonsville, but we probably need to see the the top thing that says what what the um, the positive and negatives are. You know, like what we're looking at. So prison, you're it's in prisons. Can you scroll down just a little bit? 
so that we see the top with the positive and negative cases. Okay, and the prisons. Okay, perfect. All right. So this group that I'm involved in, everybody is just terrified that we're going to have an outbreak in our prisons. In Ohio, um, they had um, one prison, that, they have 4,500 people in the prison system, in the correctional system who are infected. I think the number of deaths that I looked at on Friday was 61, including four staff. And I have a good friend that I work with on a weekly basis whose husband is a guard at Hazleton. And it just occurred to me like three or four weeks ago, oh my goodness, he could bring it home. She could get infected. I could get infected. I could spread it to my family. Her, she, her children could get it and go to school or go to Kroger's with her. I mean, you know, and um, it's a congregate setting like a nursing home. So look at Huttonsville. That's our very first outbreak. And fortunately, um, I mean, I don't, I don't understand how we can even think that it wouldn't be everywhere, you know, but um, that's the first place um, that we're sure that it is. And so there was one guard and one inmate positive, and now they've done some testing. And if you look at that, half the people who were tested were positive. That is really scary. And they haven't gone to, I think the governor is moving towards universal and periodic testing, but this has ramifications for all of us. I mean, you cannot, you cannot socially distance in prison. And people outside of the prison have to go in. And there are lots of people because we've been, we have 11,000 West Virginians who are in our jails, did something stupid, did something bad. And um, it's called corrections and rehabilitation for a reason. It's not because people are going to go in there and they deserve to die. And let's just hope that um, this positive test will bring attention to all the other um, jails, prisons, and also detention. Um, can you scroll down a little bit, Sarah, again? Um, so they also have community corrections and they also have juvenile services. Now, these are kids. And they're also in close quarters and it would just be horrible. Um, and you can see uh, with the nursing homes, I think most people feel that it was done, that was brought in by staff. And um, because, you know, the people that were there were there, you know, they're, they're older people and usually they don't, most people in nursing homes don't leave except to maybe go to the hospital. So I've gone on a long time on this. Um, the only other thing is, do you think you could bring up that graph, Sarah, about New York City or maybe show a picture of that article? Is that the Brookings? Yeah. Yes, but, I can do that. Uh, maybe just bring up the Brookings Institute article and then we can scroll down to the graph. Right. Okay. It's kind of related to this too. You know, most of the people who are in corrections are men. You know, women don't uh, either commit as many crimes or we don't get convicted as many crimes. And um, so this is the headline, COVID-19 much more fatal for men, especially taking age into account. And this article looks at China, Ireland, Wales, France, Spain. And I want you to go down to maybe two thirds of the way through um, and there's a there's a graph of, and there's advertising. There's a graph about New York and it's age adjusted. And five, th you know, it's not that big. I think this is it. There are five thousand more men than women who died, which is kind of weird if you think about our testing numbers. You know that more women are positive in West Virginia. 
And if you look at this, um, the age adjusted, the far right shows you there is like, I think they say if you, it's like two to one in the, you know, the most elderly group, which is of course, when people um, are most likely to get um, uh, COVID-19. So I think this is a really scary thing. Um, and maybe scroll up to the next paragraph before that article. Um, I think that's where they kind of explain it. Yeah, it says a two to one death rate with a gender ratio of more than two to one in death. And that is in the oldest age group. So, um, you know, it's just worrisome. And um, anyway, I think I'm surprised that I keep finding things in these numbers that are so interesting and that we learn from. And um, I hope all of you mountain mamas who are listening, have a look at your county and see what you think about the numbers in your area. And um, if there are things that we need to be talking about. One thing about the prison system is we, we don't want to upset the people that are in there. You know, we don't want to have a revolt. So we want them to know that we're going to take care of them. Um, so it's a, it's a very tricky balancing because um, a lot of them shouldn't even be there. You know, we want people to get out, which is why that Thrasher ad about justice was so unfair since the person who was let out, I think it was the end of that person's sentence. It wasn't that they got out early. But I think to the extent that we have people who are in jail because they can't afford bail, I think that we should be letting them out so they don't get exposed. This is somebody's son. This is somebody's daughter. This is somebody's boyfriend. This is somebody's grandson. And um, they, it shouldn't be a death sentence that, that because we have overcrowded prisons. Anyway, I wanted to share that with all of you. And uh, I um, am interested in your reactions. And that's well, something Patty knows a lot about. I, I spent a lot of time on task forces and co uh, community corrections. Actually, as a charter member of community corrections when it was created. And I was chair of it. Um, when I retired, um, I, I actually, Barbara, had not even thought about the um, the uh, day centers. I, I mean, that obviously the prisons and jails, but I, I hadn't really thought of that. They, report, I don't really know what's going on with day report center, center. Right. I I I don't know. I that's that is a a particular area that I haven't heard anything about. Did they just cease? Uh, reporting to the day center? Uh, I, I don't know. Well, you, it would be a lot easier um, to do social distancing right now. You know, yeah. like somebody somebody was saying that we could have a legislative meeting at the um, at the convention center because no one else was meeting there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so there should be places. There should be more space on the outside, but on the inside, you know, it's it's fixed spaces. So you know. Yeah. Yeah, attendance for food, the line, line for pills. Yeah, but when you're when you're showering and the, and the food, I mean, you're not doing those things at day report centers. But yeah, there's that that's still an area that that could lead to. Oh yeah, yeah, and that that is certainly those are the um, that's the alternative sentencing that mm -hmm. you know, nobody, nobody's contemplating that that sentence will result in death. Yeah. It's, right. it's certainly part of the rehabilitation part of the of the whole division. So, um, so that that's really interesting, and it's kind of mind boggling. I mean, every time you think, I there is so much to think about. This data is amazing. I well, it, if, you know, and when we found out that we had this little bitty church that had this anniversary celebration in Mon County 
and they had 120 people in there. Like, it's a tiny church. I cannot imagine how they got that many people. And and it's so sad. Everyone in the choir got sick. Everyone. Yeah. They came on a van over from Marion County, Stephanie. They belong to Morning Star Church. And um, they had a ceremony at Morning Star in the morning. And what was supposed to be a really positive, um, happy event was it turned into, you know, a death spiral and a lot of people who got really really sick quickly Um, and you know they didn't know either that they were more vulnerable and this was just early and it was just on the cusp well one thing i just happened to think about community corrections is that because they're they're going back and forth in a lot of counties they are transported by a van um because uh there's just no public transportation and, and a lot of those folks in who have been sentenced to day report centers don't have their driver's license. So you've got people being picked up six or eight of a van going to the day report center. So I really have not heard how they're dealing with that and and, and some of these other. And there's issues. so many issues. Transportation is a big one. Yes. Like, um, you know, apparently people, I heard that people at Hazleton refuse to bring in any more new prisoners on that because they pick them up. And that was what was going to happen is they were going to be from C. And so the driver said, no, we're not doing it. Yeah. And um, and you have to think about the people whose family members are um, incarcerated in D.C. You know, they must be absolutely terrified. I don't my um, my daughter went to a demonstration in Chicago, which is still a very hot spot. And it was outside the cook county jail where they were there were several thousand people that were infected there and people had cardboard signs that said help me and um it just was chilling that's so sad i hope i think the governor's office and the correct i mean there's so many things you have to do you have to have the sanitation i think they're 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 going to start really rolling on it just like they did with the nursing homes and we have to be proud that our state was the first one Mm -hmm. to have every nursing home staff and um person who resident tested so i hope that happens um just the same in our correction system And, and just a real quick shout out to all the people behind the scenes who are putting together this data, the website, and pushing out the information. These people's, you won't know their names, yeah. but they're making sure that you're informed. And uh, I, I think all of us would really encourage you as a constituent, as a citizen to go to that website, get the information you need to know and, um, and be informed. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention Ramelia Hodges here in Marion County. Now, I'm, I only know a little bit about um, the church incident, but I know that she was very influential in the contact tracing and just really pushing, um, pushing that testing. And I know that they had two full days of free testing uh, at a local park in Fairmont uh, targeting that minority groups. But regardless, um, I think what she's done to, to just mobilize and, and to get that done was amazing. Yes, and Danielle Walker too. Yes, and Danielle Walker. I don't want to forget Delegate Walker. She is always just, uh, she's so well known, even even though she's Mon County Delegate, uh, even in Marion County, because she's just so active everywhere. She's a real champion. They had, Patty, did you know they, had, they are going to have pes- testing in Fayette County? They've also had... Uh, Raleigh and the Eastern Spoon Handle kind of early, and I don't think they really rolled it out uh, so they had enough publicity, but also Cabell County. So, um, right. Yeah, we had tests here in Kanawha. Um, right. we tested Maybe two weekends in a row. Yeah, I, th- I think so. A lot of people went. I- I'm just going to mention one thing on the age thing, which um, I mean, sometimes I have to remind myself that when they talk about the vulnerable age group, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's me. Just but, because you have blonde hair, exactly. <laughs> but it's uh, I, it, it's the uh, it, you see some of these crazy things that I, I just love it when some, some people say, "But well, it's just affecting old people." Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Tell that to the parents of the children who have passed away. Exactly. Exactly. Like uh, you know, you're talking about 
uh, I'm still somebody's mother. I'm a grandmother and I don't really relate even to being in that age group. I just happen to be. And, and that, 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 that is seen as expendable or you're going to die soon anyway. So why did we all have to stay at home for you is just, you know, these are or things that, or that we have to open up right now. That oh. The economy is so yeah. much more important than people's lives Yeah, because it's all people's lives. I mean, it's just really, um, these are some things at the core of our society that, that need to be discussed when, when this is over and cooler heads prevail and we realize that you know, every generation adds to this world where there's not, no one is expendable. No. And now, that, um, just a real quick, uh, Hobart Collins has a question here. How about the drug courts in various counties? Um, and I can say, I do not know the answer to that question. We could certainly reach out to the courts and ask and, and, and get that information. Does anybody know? I, do. I would assume the courts shut down. It, yeah, all the courts were shut down. So, and we only have drug courts in four counties. Um, that right. was that was the pilot project. But um, you know, we they're going to have those issues. <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, when they're going to have the transport issues um, mm -hmm. from corrections. Yeah. And, um, but I know that they've really been thinking a whole lot about opening up and how they're gonna do it. So we'll see, it's gonna roll out, I think next week. Yes, I, yeah, I believe that's right. Barbara, the program that you're involved in that you said you took phone calls with every week, now are they advocating to release uh, these prisoners that are maybe just there because they can't afford bail? I mean, we have over a 20, like something like a 20% poverty rate. It just makes sense that that, that that corresponds with our our overcrowded prisons. I think I read somewhere that uh, prison population's gone up like three hundred or four hundred percent. It's really, really gone up over over the years. I mean, for a while we were passing felonies like candy, like we were handing out candy. It's it's a po because you know there's not a lot of evidence that people improve after they've been in prison. Um, but the good news is we did pass legislation last year to change the bail law and also to change the law so that um, losing your driver's license will no longer be a, pel uh, a penalty when you can't pay a court fine or some other kind of ticket fine. If you can't pay, then um, they go back to the old way, like they maybe put a lien on your property or something like that. But, um, you know, it's just such a cycle if somebody loses their driver's license. If we want them to be contributing members of society, you know, say they get a DUI and they go through the program, the interlock program, and they stop drinking because that's the only way they can drive. And then they maybe drive without their light. Well, I don't know. I guess I don't have the order right. But I mean, to me, that was a really big mistake. I think people felt like, well, maybe they'll listen. Maybe they'll pay their fines. And Patty, you know about that too, don't you? <laughs> because she worked as the, uh, for the county association. Um, I think, you know, sometimes it seemed, you know, we weren't going to be able to um, raise taxes. There was such opposition to that, but we needed to pay for various programs like community corrections. So sometimes we dedicated fines and we increase the price of tickets and so on to pay for programs because they were important. And even courthouse restoration, you know, is paid for with a little tack on. And, you know, that was a big mistake, I believe, saying that you should take away somebody's driver's license for not paying a fine. Yeah. And I, I know that I've got friends who have, uh, you know, are, in recovery and served their time, went to jail, um, and are desperately trying to get back on track and go to work, have a job, be a contributing member of society. They've learned so much. They're in, you know, constantly going to meetings, but they can't get a driver's license. <laughs> and it's, we wonder why recidivism is so high. Right. I mean, it's right. like we just keep, it's a punitive measure over and over and over again. Well, this new bill will have a way to get your driver's license back in addition to going 
forward, it also goes backwards and set up, sets up a payment plan. And you have to, I think it costs like $25 to start. Um, and, you know, in part because I think there are bonds that are dependent on this ticket money coming in. So, you know, it, we, we do need to make sure that some of that gets paid. But um, a lot of times it doesn't get paid because people are in poverty anyway. So, so we have a system where they can, you know, if those, maybe your friends are going to be able to get their driver's license back. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, it would be. And, and to me, it makes sense. You know, if you're a business, and you sell products, but then maybe you have a payment plan, a, you know, some type of finance plan. To me, that makes sense that you, as a city, you can use that for budgeting purposes or a county or whatever. It just seems to me to make sense. It's like a maintenance, you know, it's, you know what that revenue is going to be for the most part, or at least you've got an idea. Or am I just out of, does that not make sense to? <laughs> no, it does. You you need to be able to budget and you know that you're going to have that revenue, sadly. Right. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, po we know that poverty just makes every mountain that much harder to climb. And, and that often drugs are a cyclical process. You get better. You fall, in, you fall in, um, out of rehabilitation. I want to say out of re remission, but I know it's not correct. Um, and that we do definitely, like, I believe that we have to have be accountable for our actions. So we want to make it, you know, that will help us grow and become more responsible citizens. But at the same time, if you can't, if you don't have, if you don't have a license or you don't have a job, then you can't pay the fine, but you need your license to have the job to pay the fine. So payment plan seems to be the best solution all the way around. Uh, having worked um, with the foster care system, and just talking to the social workers and our own personal experiences, uh, we see that that every hurdle is just that much higher when you're in poverty, and that you know drug abuse and and alcoholism can happen to all socioeconomic levels. Well, and as uh, West Virginian uh, Julia Keller says. Uh, for children, poverty is the worst trauma because there's not a damn thing they can do about it. There's nothing. They have no power, no control in terms of who makes what and what their parents are doing. And it was a very powerful statement when she made it. Hey, can I ask a question of Stephanie? Yeah. Stephanie, I don't, you know, this is the first time we've met. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Um, like where you grew up? And I was wondering about, is that your maiden name, Spears? Yes. Are you related to Jay Spears? No, I don't believe I, so. I would blame her if I were you. Do you remember her, Patty and DL? Mm -hmm. She was um, a senator and I think, well, she was a House of Delegates mm -hmm. member first, probably. I think she was the first female finance chair. Really? Yes. Um, my father's family oh, is from right? Wheeling. Um, so I don't really know a lot about them. My, um, my father grew up uh, or was born in the Crittenton home and was adopted um, oh. out of the Crittenton house many years ago. So uh, unfortunately, outside of his parents, I don't know any Spearses. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm from Ida May, which is a tiny little coal town in Marion County. But uh, I'm a Mannington girl, Husky country. My mom was an Elliot. Um, so that's the family that that I that I know and I think it, I don't I, I just tell my kids oh that's your cousin that's your cousin there's like 400 of them <laughs> when we probably go to, related Stephanie we probably are we go to like our family reunion every year I'm like just say hi if I don't introduce you because mommy can't remember or go ask your grandma <laughs> how old but, are your kids Stephanie uh 17 and 13 they're getting up there my oldest just started um, her first job today. So oh, congratulations. She's going to work in a personal care, a private personal care home that's close to, it's close to our home. And um, we spent a long time there when our, our Tepka was a, uh, a resident and she just, uh, the lady who owns it was really generous and asked her if she could come sit for a few hours each day with the ladies and paint their nails and stuff like that. Oh, that's nice. Um, but I'm a teacher in Marion County. I taught uh, at Catholic education for 10 years and coached 
um, for the last 15. Uh, and then in the meantime, after I left Catholic education, I spent the last six years in public ed. Um, my husband and I are active with our board of directors here in Ida May. And I've always kind of dabbled in politics. Like, there's not a session that you're not going to find me in the gallery. Um, but the teachers uh, strike really kind of lit a fire. And I thought, well, instead of con you know, continuing to write my delegates and write my senators and, and um, you know, whomever else, those fiery passion emails, I thought, why not just be a delegate? Mm -hmm. um, well, I know. <laughs> I'm a firm believer that we do need change in accountability in Charleston and that we need uh, a legislative body that's going to put West Virginians first. And, I mean, there's no um, denying that we're at a critical moment. We have no opportunity. Our population is always declining. Uh, our poverty is, is and foster care. And I mean, our problems are great. Uh, and they, they don't seem to really, to me, of course, I'm only from the outside looking in. So please, I take no, hope you take no offense. Um, but I just, I think that we're not really talking to the people. We're not really trying to not, we don't have any meaningful solutions to our greatest problems and that we need to do something, anything. Well, but, and we, we don't have a plan. That's the, and, and we've been, Patty and I, and I think it's been sent to everybody, um, you know, are working on this plan because if you, if you want to solve problems, first of all, you identify the issues, the problems, then you come up with the solutions, then you implement a plan to roll out those solutions. And I just don't see that we have, uh, you know, I think we're making progress. But, you know, we still have the highest number of foster care kids, the highest number of uh, children in incarceration, uh, declining population, um, second or third oldest population, uh, second population. The internet. With, yeah, <laughs> second yeah. population with the uh, highest number of grandparents raising grandchildren, broadband, transportation. We, we have roads that are literally falling off the side of the hill in Marion County. And the solution is, well, let's just put a barrel in it. You know, okay, now we have a, a road where we have a cone on top of the barrel. And it's, it, <laughs> oh, I'm sure the, that helps. Yeah, the, hum, the humor has left. You know, <laughs> um, my husband and I gets a little worked up sometimes, and he, he'll be like, you know, I pay taxes when, when I work, they take it out of my check. I pay property taxes. I pay taxes to buy gas. I pay taxes, taxes, taxes. And I can't even drive my car down the road without busting a tire. You know, um, but that is, that's just the mantra I hear every time I drive anywhere with them. But no, I just, and the, the, the lack of opportunity, I've worked with kids for years of all socioeconomic levels. I have kids that are in the juvenile justice system now um, that I have to teach. It's hard to make education meaningful when they don't, when there's so much insecurity. Where am I going to sleep tonight? What am I going to eat tonight? You know, where's my mom? Um, I, it's, I feel very much called to help but uh, these children, but I feel like I could do more uh, in Charleston, which is, you know, why I run. My husband and I um, have spent years, like, trying to give kids opportunity. Like, we drive 200 to pick up kids so they can come and play soccer and drive to Clarksburg. I remember one day I drove to Morgantown, to Mayington, to 100, to Clarksburg, to go back to Morgantown so that I would – you know, everybody could get to play the soccer game because they didn't have transportation. And that takes a lot of people who live in the South don't realize that is a very, very long. That's a very trip. long haul. And I would Probably do it again. Day. Yes. And I would do it again. Uh, what we need to, you know, we just, I just feel called to do more, to be more, to, to be louder. I don't know. And I'm sure you guys, you feel the same patty you're running. Barbara, I followed you uh, for a while now in the house. And I actually do think I met you a few years ago when I came to speak in the house um, when they had open discussion. Uh, it was ever so briefly um, where they gave everybody 40 seconds in a public hearing. I was not selected, um, but um, Delegate Lo Delegate Longstreth uh, got me on the floor. Delegate Lovejoy was kind enough to give me his chair for the day. And I remember it actually I sent my husband a picture and I said, this is my next desk. Um, oh, nice. so, <laughs> Well, wow. it's nice that Linda is giving you uh, an entree or Ariana <laughs> or um, oh, what's his name? 
How many how many candidates are there for how many seats? There are nine de uh, Democratic candidates and three Republicans for three seats. We do have one incumbent, Mike Angelucci. Um, so it's a, it's definitely a large field. Yeah. Well, and speaking of a large field, uh, let's uh, we are running uh, up against the clock, and so let's move to Patty if we can. Um, to get an update on the absentee ballot and maybe talk about, you know, dates of importance coming up for this particular election. Sure. I've, I've, uh, Barbara and Stephanie, I've really enjoyed your all's conversation. Um, and the one way people can make change is to vote. Um, <clears throat> so it looks like the absentee ballot process is, is fairly popular. This is as of Friday. They didn't have numbers for today. Um, the total requested was 247,132. The total returned, and again, this is, <clears throat> this is as of Friday, uh, 134,962. So th that, that many West Virginians have voted. Wow. Now, if you, uh, if my math is correct, which which I put no guarantees on, um, but the uh, if you go 100 percent, 1.2 million registered voters, that's already 11 percent of registered voters. But we know that we're not going to get 100 percent participation. So if you get more like 700,000 people, which is uh, a more realistic number that would vote, um, then you're then you're over 19 percent. So you're. Uh, so it is proving popular. Um, this is a, an important week because early voting starts on May 27th. That's Wednesday. And it goes for 10 days. Those 10 days include two Saturdays. Um, so it starts on May 27th. Not every county has early community voting. Um, but that might be something that all the Mountain Mamas could put on their Facebook pages and websites and so forth. Um, if your county does have early community voting, then put the locations um, of those. Some counties have not implemented early community voting. In other words, there's only one place and that that's at the courthouse. Um, so, but that's good information for folks to have. So um, the, uh, one thing I wanted to add, 39 states have early voting and West Virginia was fairly early on with early voting. It's very popular. Um, it didn't start out to be, it started out a little bit. Some people thought it was radical. Election day was sacred. You couldn't mess with election day, um, but the legislature passed it and it has really increased in popularity uh, almost with each election cycle. What it hasn't done, unfortunately, is really increase the turnout. It, it's the turnout is still pretty bad, pretty abysmal. Um, but people do like the option to early vote. So, so that starts May twenty seventh to June sixth. <coughs> Patty, I have a question. Sure. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, now the Secretary of State sent out absentee ballots, right? No, the ab application. Actually, they came out. They went. They came out from the county clerks. <coughs> okay. Yes, every every registered voter got one. So, <coughs> the two hundred and forty-seven thousand are the people that sent it back in. Yes. And asked for a ballot. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Now, one thing that our county clerk was saying is, if you did that if you got a ballot, you are not allowed to go in and early vote or vote on election day. Is that right? Here's my <laughs> understanding. Um, if you have requested a ballot, um, you, you will have a problem um, because you're going to get that ballot and now you've early voted and they might cross paths. So, well, it's, if you decide, you know what, I I I feel safer now. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to go in, and I I think it needs to be clear to people that's not a good idea because they have recorded idea. that you requested a ballot. It has a number, 
Um, so you mm -hmm. should do one or the other. Is that yes. right? If you are logged in as having requested one and the poll worker or. And in fact, you have a ballot, you have a ballot out there. Yeah, exactly. It may have already been mailed to you and now you're coming into early vote and then you're going to get a ballot. So it's problematic. It's best to just use that absentee ballot. If you don't want to, you could and you want to go in and vote, call the county clerk, get it cleared. But it's best just to let the ballot come to you and, and vote it. Now, it's a it's um, a, a different story if you've already received that ballot. So. Oh, that's what I was talking about. Well, I mean, if you've requested it, but you haven't received it, you will have a problem because it will be mailed to you. But I mean, if you've received it, they yeah. have it down. They well, it's actually, it with a number, right? Yeah, it's actually easier if you've received it. You can take it with you. Oh. And, but if you haven't received it, it's in the works, and you're there to early vote. That's actually a little more of a problem. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, but if you receive one, take it with you to the polls. If but it's really best to just use it. And don't vote in person if you if you request it done. Patty, I've had questions about um, marking your your uh, candidate. I guess on one side of the ballot it said to put an X, and on the inside it said to do a circle, fill in the circle. Does it matter how they mark their ballot? Just so that their intent is clear. My understanding is if if the um, if there if the machine can't read it. They will look at it during the canvas, and if your intent is clear, it most likely will be counted. Like, like the, I, 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 Kanawha County has ovals, and it tells you to, you know, carefully fill in the ovals. So, if you're all out of line on your ovals, and yeah. you can't read it, but they they can read that during canvas and and see your intent. Now, if you've accidentally gone into another oval and marked it and messed it all up. Um, then they they may have to declare that a, a ballot that they can't count because it's it's too messed up. But yeah, it is. Um, and then you can actually correct it as well. You just have to mark it out. Like if you get an absentee ballot and messed up on it, you can put a note on it and go get that and cross it out. That I, I guess I should emphasize. The county clerks, the commissioners, they want as few provisional ballots to deal with as possible. I mean, they really want your ballots to be correct and counted because it's always a problem for them if if there's a problem with your ballot. So there, there's there's no uh, there's no reason they want to not count your ballot. They want to look for every reason to count it. Well, um, we are closing in on the eight o'clock hour, so I have to be the disciplinarian here and stay on task, but I'm going to. Uh, we did not get to talk about what it means to be a mountain mama, but I do encourage everyone who's watching uh, either live or on the replay to visit our website, uh, mountain, MTN, mama, uh, wv.org, and get to know your candidates. If you have questions about COVID-19, Delegate Flash Hour is available. You've got uh, candidate Patty Hamilton, Hamilton for House, uh, who can pretty much tell you everything about voting. Uh, get a hold of uh, Stephanie and talk with her about if you're up in her district. Get to know yes, her. Please. Get to know everybody that is running for office. Um, again, West Virginia has the lowest number of women in a uh, state legislature, and uh, that's kind of embarrassing, but uh, we can change that, folks. So, uh, DL, anything else for the good of the order? Uh, one, back to your ballot request. If you have not sent it in, you have until, I think, June 3rd, but do not wait that long. Send right. that request in this week. And if you are a non-party, independent, registered voter, Remember that uh, to vote for Mountain Mamas, they all happen to be on the Democratic ballot. So you need to request the Democratic ballot if you want to vote for Mountain Mamas. So I uh, was sitting here and turned off the video so that you all wouldn't see me hitting up my sister's jelly bean jar. <laughs> and 
I was trying to think of other F words. And I'm not going to use that one. And I won't say them all since we're going to wrap up on time today. But the one thing we use the most is that we are forward thinking. Barbara used the word progressive, but a lot of people say, well, what's that mean? So we just want to say we're moving West Virginia forward. You know, we do not want to go backwards. And so with the F words, we are forward thinking. Forward thinking. And I had a lot of other F words, but the most important one is that Mountain Mamas will fight for your future. So things are getting down to the wire. Hope you can spend some time over the next couple of weeks working for the Mountain Mama or other candidate of your choice. Get some friends to the polls and let's all feel like we are moving West Virginia forward for the primary election after June 9th. And I will, before we forget, um, if you would like to make a donation to the Mountain Mamas, again, you can visit the website mtnmamawv.org and donate to help support these candidates uh, and their um, uh, uh, fight to help move <laughs> West Virginia forward. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm multitasking here. So, uh, and I'm failing obviously, but uh, well, again, thanks everybody for joining us this evening. Uh, we'll be back again next week and we'll be talking about a lot of different things. And I really encourage everybody who's walking or the, uh, who's watching or those who are watching on the replay, please ask questions. This is your chance to get to know who your, your candidates or your delegates please get to know everybody. So ladies, good to see you uh, again. Thanks to all of our military personnel, those who are no longer with us and those who are currently serving and their families. And we will bid you all farewell. Stay fierce uh, and flexible. Oh, okay. and flexible. That's right. That's a lot of F words there. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. Yeah. You too. It was nice meeting you, Barbara and Patty. Bye. Yes.